back to Animal Wonders. I'm Jessie and this is Clover the Little Rabbit. Now, one of my favorite things about working with animals is that there's always something new to learn. And I can get pretty excited about some of the neat things that I come across. For example, check out these three weird things that some animals can do. I love learning new things, especially when it's something that I never would have imagined, like how some animals' normal everyday functions are so very different than my own. Today, let's talk about three weird things that some animals can do that we just can't. First, did you know that frogs swallow with their eyeballs? This is Stumpy the White's tree frog. Look how big her eyes are. She uses them to help her see and catch her prey at night. But these huge eyes also help her to swallow her prey whole. When she's hunting, her eyes sense the motion of her prey. Say it's a cricket. She focuses in on the movement and then she launches herself forward with these long back legs. She then uses her short, sticky tongue to snatch the prey and bring it into her mouth. Once it's inside her mouth, she does something completely different than humans do. When we have a mouthful of food, we swallow it by using our tongue to push the food down our throat. Stumpy's tongue is not like ours though. Instead of using her tongue, she blinks and her eyeballs move inward, pushing the mouthful of cricket down her throat. Check out Jabba the African pixie frog doing the same thing. It's so weird, but so awesome. The second weird animal thing is cockroaches can live up to a month without their head. Maybe don't do this any cockroaches that you know because the head can't be reattached and it doesn't grow back, so they will eventually die. This is Sue, she's a Madagascar hissing cockroach. All 4,500 species of cockroaches have brains. So do we, but if we lost our head, we most definitely wouldn't be able to survive because we can't live without our brain. But cockroaches can, so if it's not the brain that keeps them alive, what is it? It actually has to do with how they breathe. Now, humans need a brain in order to breathe. But instead of having a brain controlling their breathing through their mouth and lungs, cockroaches breathe through tiny holes along their side called spiracles. The spiracles bring oxygen directly to their body without the use of blood. So if they lose their head, they can continue to breathe and their body will remain alive. But there's one thing that they can't continue to do without a head. They can't eat. Ultimately, their cause of death will be starvation because they have no mouth to eat with. The third weird animal thing also has to do with breathing. Birds are so efficient at breathing that they are continuously moving fresh air through their lungs, kind of like if we were able to inhale and exhale at the same time. While us humans are left being half as good at something as simple as breathing, birds excel because of the way they move and store oxygen in their bodies. Birds have lungs, but they also have air sacs throughout their body, usually nine of them. When a bird inhales, fresh air goes into their lungs and the air sacs towards the back of their body. When they exhale, the used air from their lungs moves into their front air sacs. At the same time, the fresh air in their back air sacs moves into their lungs. When they inhale a second time, fresh air once again goes into their lungs and back air sacs. They exhale a second time, and the used air from their lungs pushes the used air in their front air sacs out their mouth. At the same time, fresh air in their back air sacs enters their lungs. This form of breathing is called unilateral breathing, meaning the air continuously moves in one direction, thanks to many specialized valves. So humans move air in and then out, while birds move air in a cyclical pattern, which is how they're able to sustain the heavy demands of extended periods of flight. There are thousands of weird and interesting things to learn about animals, and I'll never get tired of learning more. I will always enjoy watching frogs swallow. It's just so weird and I love it. Another one of my favorite animals to watch just being themselves are owls. And they're famous for being able to turn their head around, but can they really turn their head all the way around? Hello and welcome back to Animal Wonders. I'm Jesse, and this is Lulu. He is a half moon conure, also known as an orange fronted parakeet. Look at this neat thing that he can do. He's turning his head totally backwards. Birds are so cool. Many people think owls are the only birds that can turn their head all the way around, but that's not totally true. So let's delve into what makes birds so flexible and especially what makes owls so unique. We have a lot of birds that we care for here, and I love taking them to presentations to educate about where they live, what they eat, how they survive, and their interesting adaptations. And when we get to the part about being able to turn their heads around, it surprises people. But it's actually common for most birds to tuck their heads back when they sleep, and if you watch them closely, birds spend a lot of time grooming their feathers from their neck 
all the way down to their tail. Parrots like Zoe have 10 bones in their necks called cervical vertebrae, and they can't turn their head all the way around, but they can go almost 180 degrees. Want to show she has eyes on the side of her head, so like other prey animals, she's able to easily see most of the area around her, which allows her to watch out for potential predators. I always found it interesting to see parrots look down, because they don't face forward and look down, they often tilt their head to the side for better viewing with just one eye. Now, raptors, which include eagles, hawks, falcons, owls, among others, have 14 or more vertebrae in their necks. Hera, the Harris's hawk, can turn her head a full 180 degrees, which allows her to groom her feathers, but the neck flexibility is also one of the important adaptations that allows her to spot prey during flight. The eye placement on the front of her head gives her binocular vision, meaning the field of vision for each eye overlaps, and this allows for more precise depth perception, which makes her an excellent hunter. But even hawks can't turn their head completely around, and actually, there isn't a single bird that can, but there is one that gets pretty close. Owls. Owls have some amazing adaptations, and one of their most impressive is their neck. But when you look at an owl, usually the first thing that stands out is their incredible eyes. To understand why a flexible neck would be important for an owl, let's compare our human eyes to theirs. If you hold your head completely still and then move your eyes left, right, up and down to see as far around you as possible, you can see more than if you just stare straight forward. That's because humans have spherical eyes with six muscles each that can move the eye in a bunch of different directions. This allows us to look all around without having to move our heads. But owls have eyes that are quite different. An owl's eyes are shaped like tubes, and they're held in place by bones called sclerotic rings. Their eyes don't move much, so if they want to look around, turning their whole head is the best option. Of course, humans can turn their head as well, but not even close to how far owls can. From a front-facing position, humans can turn their head about 90 degrees to the right or to the left. But owls? Owls can turn their heads 270 degrees to either the left or the right. It's amazing to watch. So while owls can't actually turn their head a full 360 degrees, most people are at least familiar with the idea that owls can turn their head really far, which is awesome, but knowing how they do it is even more awesome. Let's start off by comparing our necks to owl necks. Humans have seven cervical vertebrae, and owls have 14. And in some cases, having more bones at one joint can increase that joint's movement and flexibility. For example, if you hold your upper arm firmly in place and then bend your elbow, you can see it can move back and forth. This is because our elbow is a hinge joint and only has three bones, so it doesn't have much flexibility. But if you now hold your forearm in place and move your wrist, you can see there's more movement. This is because our wrist is a synovial joint and has four bones, so there's more flexibility and range of motion. While there are other factors as well, there's only a difference of one bone between your elbow and your wrist. So imagine the difference seven bones can have on an already quite flexible part of your body, like your neck. And an owl's neck is way more flexible than ours due to the number of cervical vertebrae and also the shape of those bones. So if we imagined that we have 14 specially shaped cervical vertebrae in our necks like an owl, we should be able to turn our heads 270 degrees and look behind us, right? Nope, we still can't because there's something else that makes owls extra special. This is probably something you've never thought of being a problem with simply turning your head. And it's kind of weird, but super serious. If we turned our heads as far as owls, we would actually cause ourselves to have a stroke. Some strokes occur when blood flow is cut off to part of your brain. And to protect our blood vessels when we turn our head, the bones in our neck have small holes for them that are just big enough to allow them to fit. They keep the vessels tucked in safely against our neck bones, but this means if we turn our necks really far like an owl can, it would cause a strain on the trapped vessels and they would likely get stretched, pinched, or torn in the process. And without the proper flow of blood, your brain wouldn't get the oxygen it needs and within minutes, your brain cells would start to die. So how do owls get around this problem? Well, there's actually quite a few adaptations that allow for their amazing flexibility in their necks. First, they have very special bones and blood vessels. If we look closely at the cervical vertebrae in an owl's neck, 
we can see that the holes for their blood vessels are 10 times larger than their vertebral artery. So when they turn their neck, the arteries aren't trapped, which causes less strain. Next, the first two vertebrae in an owl's neck don't have holes along the side like the others, so the arteries have much more slack when the neck is turned. Also, both arteries are positioned close to the axis of rotation, so the chances of pinching or overly straining them is greatly decreased. And the vertebral artery enlarges as it nears the top of the neck and the base of the skull, which is interesting because the general rule for arteries in humans is that they get smaller the farther they are from the heart. But for owls, this enlargement allows for a small amount of pooling of fresh oxygenated blood right after the neck. So if an owl is twisting its head and blood flow is restricted, it's hypothesized that there's still a small amount of fresh blood that the brain can use to avoid a stroke. Which is just so much more in depth than you've probably ever thought about an owl doing its iconic head tilt and turn. So owls have really impressive adaptations that allow them to turn their heads upside down and 270 degrees around, and now you know how they can do it. But their neck is only one of the awesome adaptations they have. What makes owls amazing in my eyes is that they are perfectly adapted to their environment. Like they have silent flight to sneak up on their prey, they have excellent hearing but pretty unusual ear placement, and of course their fascinating eyes and amazing night vision. And keep in mind that many of the things we know about bird anatomy and owls' superb neck turning abilities are still being studied, so we don't know everything yet. And I'm excited that I get to keep learning as more discoveries are made. Owls are so interesting. Now, as someone who cares for a lot of animals, I have gotten really comfortable cleaning up after them, which entails plenty of poop. <laughs> so of course I'm curious about that too, and I love to share. So check out these four fun feces facts. There's something interesting that happens when you care for many, many animals. You start paying attention to not only what goes into their bodies, but also what comes out. Paying attention to their feces, yes their poop, is a great way to know the health of the animal at a glance. So for many people that care for animals, talking about poop becomes as common as how's the weather. And actually, though people around you might not agree, poop is a really interesting subject to talk about. So let's talk about poop. Now sadly, some animals may never even know what their feces looks like or they don't care because once it leaves their body, it holds no more use for them. But some awesome animals find their feces quite functional. Fun feces fact number one. Pigeons and doves use their feces to help them build their nest. Pigeon and dove parents begin by building a rudimentary nest out of sticks and grass, and then they lay two eggs. Once the chicks hatch, the nest gets pretty messy pretty fast because the chicks will poop right in and around the rim of the nest. The droppings harden and begin to build up layer after layer. These layers of poop actually add to the structure of the nest, making it sturdier, which gives the next set of chicks an even cozier home. Ah, a nice comfy nest made of dried packed feces. Fun feces fact number two. Some animals use poop to survive the winter. Foxes will often save stashes of food in the summer to make sure they have enough to last the long winter months when food is scarce. This is called caching, and they don't just have one cache, they have many. In order to know where each cache is located once it's snowed, the fox will mark the spot with urine and feces. This way they can smell the stink through the layers of snow and know exactly where to dig to get the leftovers. Fun feces fact number three. Vultures poop on themselves to keep clean. Vultures like to dine on animals that have already died, and the carcass is full of bacteria that could cause other animals to get sick. But vultures have two awesome adaptations that help prevent this. Vultures often don't have feathers on their head, and that's because they have to get right down into their food source and they don't want rotten meat and bacteria stuck to their head. They also have to crawl inside and they don't want it stuck to their legs either, so they poop on themselves. Bird droppings consist of uric acid and feces. Uric acid is so acidic that it can kill the bacteria, so while it's actually doing the sanitizing, the feces is along for the ride. Fun feces fact number four. Wombats poop in cubes. And there's a really neat reason for it. Wombats are solitary and only come together to mate, so to prevent fights from breaking out, 
Wombats are quite particular about whose territory belongs to who. Wombats use their feces as territorial markers so they can let other wombats know exactly where their turf begins. They patrol at night walking over logs and rocks, leaving poop along the edges of their range. The flat sides of the square feces keeps them from falling off precarious places. And since wombats produce 80 to 100 cubes a day, poops that strayed from their intended position could cause a lot of confusion and a lot of unhappy wombats. I like that there's even neat things that we can learn about poop. <laughs> now, as I observe the animals that I care for, one of the more interesting behaviors is watching snakes shed. It's just such an interesting process, and knowing how snakes shed their skin is even more interesting. We're in the reptile room, and I wanted to check in on one of our snakes, because I passed by a minute ago and noticed she just recently shed. First, I'm going to get my spatula, and then we're going to see if she wants to come and join us. Hello, sweetheart. Do you want to come and say hi? Move nice and slow. Good girl. This is pine cone, and she's a bull snake or a gopher snake. We don't know her exact origin, so it's challenging to tell what subspecies she is. Let's check this shed out. Around a little bit of things here. Let's bring this back out. The first thing I notice is that the tail is a little bit compromised just on the shed. So I want to look at her tail and make sure that all of it is off. And it is. She has no retained shed on her tail. Now, the reason I wanted to check her shed very closely is because she came to us when she was blue and she looked pretty dehydrated. And so when I set her up her enclosure, I gave her a really damp half so that she could shed a lot easier. So if they get too dry, it's hard for them to shed. And she had a pretty good shed that first time. I just want to make sure that she's continuing on that healthy streak. I just think it's so fascinating how snakes shed their scales. Instead of it just like flaking off in little bits like ours does, they shed in one huge piece, it's so weird. So this is how it works. Snake skin is basically two layers, the dermis and the epidermis. The dermis is made of densely knit tissues and the epidermis covers that. And the outermost layer of the epidermis is covered in dead cells, which are made of hard keratin, which we call scales. And those scales provide protection for the living tissue below. So when a snake is about to shed, the old scales that are on the top, they start to separate from the epidermis and fluid from the lymph system fills the space between them. This process can take about a week and it causes them to look a little foggy or bluish white, which is why you can call a snake that's in the process of shedding blue. As the process goes on, the layers continue to separate and the connecting materials slowly start to break down. Then the lymph fluid is reabsorbed and the new outer layer of the epidermis dries out and becomes basically waterproof and completely separated from the old scales. At this point, the snake could start to look dull or some of the scales could be sticking up or looking a little rough. And finally, the snake will use whatever they can find to rub those old scales off. They usually start by rubbing their mouth on a branch or a rock and slowly peeling them back and off, revealing those shiny scales underneath. And pinecone is super shiny right now. Look how the light shines off of those brand new scales. My goodness, you're beautiful. You know that? Well, it looks like she is very healthy. The shed looks nice and she looks really nice. So shiny. I think it's time to let her go on back home. Snakes might make some people nervous, but I just think they're beautiful. And it's always a nice surprise getting to see the colorful garter snakes gliding through the grasses when I'm on a walk outside. I'm also a big fan of watching duck families in our local ponds. And some of their adaptations are also pretty neat. I'm constantly surprised by some of the incredible adaptations certain animals have to survive in extreme environments. Like emperor penguins in the frigid cold of Antarctica, Egyptian sandfish escaping into the sand of the desert 
desert, and anglerfish thriving in the deep dark of the ocean. So when I look at an animal like a duck, it's sometimes easy to overlook the fact that they can swim in seriously cold water or stand on ice and not have their feet freeze solid. And this is all because of an amazing thing called countercurrent heat exchange. What's happening is the warm blood from the duck's body flows down their leg and comes into close contact with cold blood traveling from their foot back up their leg. The close contact between the hot and cold blood brings the temperature of warm blood down and increases the temperature of the cold blood. This does two things. The temperature of the cold blood going back into their body heats up so it doesn't bring their core temperature down. And the warm blood gets colder before it reaches their foot, so the temperature of their foot and the temperature of the ice are closer together. Let's look at this a little closer. Heat exchange happens when there's a difference in temperature between two objects. The bigger the difference in temperature, the quicker heat will move from the hot object to the cooler object. If there's less of a difference in temperature, the heat exchange will be slower. So when the warm blood from a duck's body travels down their leg and gets cooled by the blood traveling up from the foot, the difference between the temperature of the ice and their foot gets smaller. Which means that by the time the blood gets all the way down to their foot, it's quite cold and the heat exchange decreases. Surprisingly, ducks that are standing on ice lose only about 5% of their heat from their feet, and they lose 95% from their body, even though they're covered in warm feathers. The countercurrent heat exchange system helps them survive in the cold temperatures. And the same system works for other animals too, like arctic foxes, who walk on and dig in snow for long periods of time. This is Cass, and he's showing off his amazing winter coat. His fur will definitely help, but it's not the only thing that will help him survive in the cold. Arctic foxes also have countercurrent heat exchange systems in their paws to keep them from freezing and to reduce the loss of body heat during the extremely cold winters. You have super paws, buddy! Now, countercurrent heat exchange systems not only work for cold weather animals, they also help animals who live in hot environments too. Flamingos are famous for their pink feathers and long legs, but not many people know that the waters they stand in can get incredibly hot. The shallow waters they hunt for food in can get up to 115 degrees Fahrenheit, and they could quickly become overheated if they didn't have something to protect them. Flamingos also have the same countercurrent heat exchange system in their legs like ducks do, but instead of keeping them warm, it helps cool them off. Remember that the smaller the difference in temperature between two objects, the less heat exchange will take place. So for flamingos, their body temperature is cooler than the hot water they're standing in. The cooler blood travels from their body into their leg, and as it goes down, it intertwines with hot blood coming up from their lower leg and foot. That heats up the cooler blood so when it reaches the water, it's closer in temperature so the heat exchange from the water is less dramatic than it would be if the temperature difference was bigger. The hot blood then comes back up their leg toward their body and is cooled down by the blood coming down, which makes sure they don't pump hot blood back into their body. And you've seen flamingos standing on one foot right? They do this because it's more efficient. Because they only have one foot in the hot water, it reduces the exchange of heat from the water to their body even more. So this seemingly simple thing that ducks and flamingos can do is more complicated than it looks. There's just so many weird and wonderful things to learn about animals, and I'm unashamedly enthusiastic to keep wondering and keep learning all the time. Thanks for watching! I hope you enjoyed this compilation of neat animal facts, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye!